Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello there. It's Dr. Gemma, and welcome to episode 132 of the Cognitive Podcast. Your comments are very welcome. You can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, or you can go to our group on Ravelry and find the episode and comment there. If you go to my show notes, you will see all sorts of things like my somewhat outdated YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. You can buy me a coffee if you'd like. That's really nice. What I really want you to know is I'm not going to add you to my followers on social media because I'm always getting spammed by robo accounts. So you can follow me best either on Ravelry or on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. I will be happy to respond to you either there or in the podcast itself, which leads me to say Thank you for those of you who have sent in good suggestions about CFR. Uh, The the most noteworthy ones, I think Sustainable Living really thought about this and had a lot of them. And that's really helpful. And so at the same time, I have to say, if I don't take your suggestions, please don't be offended. I don't think anybody has been so far, but I want to sort of spell that out. Because you have to remember, I'm in the field doing the footwork here. And some suggestions that make a lot of sense just did not work out on the hoof. But I have to tell you, trying to make this work just out of my own head is not always the best idea. So keep the suggestions coming and please be aware I'm grateful for them even if I can't use them. As you'll hear today, later on in the fiber retreat report in a minute or two, I really saw a lot go to the wall compared to what I was used to in the old original eight CFRs. So again, keep the suggestions coming because we're kind of in a new ball game here with organizing a retreat, but I will get back to that. Meanwhile, Amy Storm, thank you for the beautiful link to Ryan Brothers Coffee because they have a really interesting looking tea collection. I may be getting around to them pretty soon, I have to say. And South Pal, I don't say it on the show notes, but I had no idea Freeport, Maine was a crazy house. Uh, It's Maine. Do you guys have a big city? I mean, I'm impressed. I hope someday I make it out there. I have realized I'm not going up to Sunnybank this year because we've just had a storm of new expenses. And it's no big deal. It just means, you know, I, I don't have spare money this year for vacation. So it's going to be a pretty interesting year. In the meantime, we're doing fine. So don't worry about that. But I really hope, Sal Pal, I get out to Maine one fine day. But I won't be getting out to Sunnybank, it looks like. Okay, what do you really want to hear about? Let's do it. The Cognitive Fiber Retreat 2023. Still scheduled for Saturday, November 11th, 2023. I now have 34 people out of 50. We do take a wait list. I do want you to be aware that we have always been able to get our wait lists in. I don't think I've ever shut anybody out in the long run. And people will cancel. Things happen. So, you know, be patient. If you have asked to be on the list, you should have gotten a number from me. I would write back to you and say, you are number such and such. So if you did not get that, please send me a message through Ravelry or through the blog. Again, cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, but remember the K in cognitive. Please send me a message because let's make sure everybody who thinks they're on the list is actually on the list. Now, some of the original people, I may not have sent you a number. I just went like, Yahoo, okay, whatever. So right now, the... 
34 I have. Now, please remember, I'm updating this day by day, but you're only going to hear it on Saturdays when I post the podcast. So if you messaged me and you don't hear you here, well, right now I think I'm up to date. But always feel free, like I said, to send me a message through the Ravelry group, which I check every week, and uh, the blog. All right. So, so far I've got myself and Lexicom, Steffi Joe, Kai H, Andrea 9772, Jenna I, Mary P, Carmel, Pochki, Meredy, Ariane, Shiji, Jasmine, Danger Mouse, Peachy, Smidgen, TMO, Reds Knits, Good Stuff, Judy K, Priscilla A, Drew Caitlin. Oh, yeah, Drew. Thank you. Sorry, I've been calling Drew he. Drew is a she. I did wonder about that name, Drew Caitlin. I was like, is this a husband-wife account? What's going on there? So I made the rather foolish assumption. So thank you for your gentle correction, folks. Drew is a goyle, not a guy. Okay, sustainable living, Cheryl Slover, My Lady Irony, Glowing Elegy, Susan G, who is also Mama AT90807, Knit One, Pug Two, Amy Storm, Celia KC, Jedi Mom, Plexipa, Pam Hogarth, and Lisa Marchbanks. Those are the 34 as of this time. If you think your name should be on there and it's not, you know how to get me. The vendors as of this time are Lisa Souza, Oink, Tina Soaps, Laser Sheep, and Alpenglow. Again, because we don't have the venues sorted out, we don't know this yet. Okay, so that we're in the search for the venue. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. We do have a picture of the two potential colorways offered by Dizzy Blonde. Dizzy Blonde Studios, that is. You should feel free to tell me your preferences there. I'm kind of leaning towards the blues because I have a huge collection of Laura's red yellows. But I'd really rather go with the preference of everybody attending if you have a particular favorite there. In the meantime, let's talk a little bit about games and the venue. The last time we did a mini skein swap, I would like to do that again. This is not a requirement. What I would tell you is your mini skeins have to be 25 grams in weight. So we're going for about 100 yards. This means that we can just trade skeins around. This also means you take a few skeins you're not that fond of, and I'm talking about sock weight, by the way. Sock, fingering, light fingering. That should be 25 grams. You take something you're not that wild about, you skein it up, you wind it off with a scale into 25 gram shots. This lets us change colorways. All you people who bought mini skeins, surprise packages, advent calendars, whatever, like I did, who uh, didn't like them that much, this is your chance to get rid of them to someone who might like them. The way this worked last time was we didn't wear identifying buttons or anything. We just walked around with our mini skeins in our pockets and, and you said to people, hey, by the way, are you trading skeins? And people said, sure. And we just traded mini skeins. And it was a lot of fun. I believe I made a cowl out of it. I have a few patterns I'm looking at. One I know is the Manic Panic, which is a knitted cowl that comes in many sizes. You can do it as a cowl. You can do it as a scarf. In terms of a crocheted pattern, I would just go with the Calm Cowl, which is essentially... I don't remember. If it, I think the Calm Cowl is single crochet, and it's Designed for a worsted weight, but it doesn't take a lot to chain and figure out how you want to do it in a sock weight. So, yes, I am saying I want to have another mini skein swap. I thought that was a lot of fun, and it kind of randomizes your yarn collection. The raffles. I don't know how unclear or clear I've been about this. You get a ticket just for attending. You get a raffle ticket. So you're automatically in the raffles if you show up and pay your entrance fee. Actually, I will be collecting the entrance fee earlier on because I'll have to pay for things. But anyway, you show up, you get a raffle ticket. There are other ways to get raffle tickets. I am open to any suggestions for this. One way is our official charity is Mother Bear. That is Mother Bear Project. This is knitting or crocheting bears with a pattern that you buy from Mother Bear. And you send in your bear and you send in enough money to pay for its postage to 
whichever country they're sending the bears to. You can find more information about this at motherbearproject.org, I believe it is, but I'll put the link in the show notes. For every bear you bring, you get an extra raffle ticket for the goodies. Now, the goodies, the base number of goodies is the vendors, their admission fee so far looks like it's gonna be a good skein of yarn. So something worth, I would imagine, 30 to $35 that we're requesting that this is not a mini skein, this is not a mini skein set. We're asking for a good solid yarn. I've never specified the weight, but I'm looking at about 100 grams. I've never specified, you know, if this is fingering or worsted or whatever. It could simply be a gift certificate. For all I care, like Lisa Souza says, here's a gift certificate. Whoever wins this comes to my stand and picks what she wants. Whatever. Okay, I don't actually care. So that's where we are on the games, the fun and games. So far, no offers for classes. So I don't know if there will be classes, but also that's kind of key because now I'm going to talk about how I went looking for a venue today. This is very preliminary. No panic. What I did today was I went looking at local hotels. I drove around and I saw about, oh gosh, about eight of them. And we have some good contenders, not many. I think we've got basically two. But I have to tell you, the good old days of handshake deals, like I did in the original eight CFRs, those are pretty much over. So I have to call these people in the sales office and they have to call me back and we have to talk about it. I have seen some good spaces. There's a Fairfield Inn that's up above a shopping area in Stevenson's Ranch. And the Fairfield and the Marriott there, the res- it's a Marriott Residence Inn, they share space and they share a business space. And that looked like a really good space compared to the good old days. However, I'm waiting to hear from them and I'm looking at a Hilton, I'm looking at a Holiday Inn. I don't feel good about this. I feel like these people really want us to pay. There isn't going to be any goodwill here. That, in other words, one of the things that went on with the La Quinta back in the day was we sold so many rooms for them that they just gave us the banqueting room for free because they really wanted us to come back every year because we were filling their hotel out in the middle of nowhere. They were the farthest from the main event in town, which on the weekends was the prison. It was not coincidental that I picked the hotel farthest from the prison, but also they just really worked with me on making this happen. So I don't know. These other hotels may work with me when I start talking to their salespeople, but I don't feel like this is personal or friendly the way that was. So we will just have to see how that works out. But One of the things that occurred to me as I was driving through Stevenson Ranch and I looked over and I saw the Stevenson Ranch Public Library and I kind of had a brainwave and said, why am I not looking at a public library or a community center? Well, let me tell you why. I really like this as a hotel based retreat. That was really wonderful because everybody just got up. We all were at breakfast. They provided, you know, a low end breakfast. We were all at breakfast together and then we all just meandered to the pool. I was there with everybody so I would sort of stand up and go, okay, okay, pool time and we'd all just migrate out. And then, you know, they just left us alone when we met by the pool because we're all paying for rooms. Why can't we meet at the pool? And then we would meander in and go to the sales floor in the banqueting room and so on. And we were using our own rooms and sometimes the banqueting room for classes. It just went very smoothly when we did it in a hotel. Those days may be over, that if the cost of renting the space is going to be prohibitive, then I don't know. And the other thing that really annoyed me, apart from the fact the young woman I talked to at the Marriott, I mean, seriously, you could have heard the ocean if you listened to her ears. She was not very bright. It was just terrifying. I would tell her one thing and watch her write something completely different down and say, but you're not writing down what I'm saying. And she'd go, yeah, I am. It was really crazy. But anyway, apart from my frustrations, I really felt like they just didn't care. I really felt like everybody I talked to said, well, how many rooms are you going to want? And they were acting as though they were doing me a big favor instead of working with me to maximize the chance 
of me using their hotel. Now, this could be because we're in a more heavily populated area. They don't feel like they need us. I had never thought much about this with the original CFR. I just felt like it was good to do it in Tehachapi because I used to work up there so I could just leave work and go talk to the hotel, things like that. It never occurred to me that population was playing into this so heavily. So that's kind of where that is. So I am still venue hunting and the venue may be changing from previous years in terms of we may not just be in a hotel, which is kind of interesting, which, you know, it also means I'm just going to turn you all loose with Expedia.com or Hotel.com or Booking.com or whoever to find a good booking for yourselves. I hate that. I really would like to keep the hotel-based format. I really felt that that added a lot to the closeness. But, you know, don't go dropping off the list or panicking, let me see what I can do. This is just going to take a few weeks to work through. But this is why I'm starting in May, shortly to be June, for something happening in November. So no panic there. But that's what we have. And again, since I don't know the venue, I'm not pursuing classes at this point. Meanwhile, you are saying, but Gemma, this was a knitting podcast. What's on my hooks and needles? And let's not forget my sewing needle because I did finish. In fact, I'm wearing as I speak one of my circle skirts. I'm so happy. This is Simplicity 8863 from 1996. Okay, I have to admit it, Joanne Fabrics had a Memorial Day sale. Now, I thought I'm going to go in there and I'm going to score all this cotton and make all these light cotton skirts. Nope. Turns out the great sale that I used to buy my cotton fabric, my lightweight cotton fabric, calicos, whatever, that sale's pretty much over. And they did not put it more on sale for Memorial Day. I was really shocked. What they did put on sale, Kalu Kale, was a lot of their flannels. And that was just beautiful. They put this huge amount of flannel out for three bucks a yard. Considering their flannel is 10 bucks a yard minimum, I was one pretty happy camper. This means my full circle skirts, which take like four and five eighths yards, but frankly, I always buy a five yard cut because it's way easier to cut out the pieces that way. Just take my word for it. I buy it in five yard cuts. Well, a full circle skirt in a beautiful flannel for 15 bucks. Oh, you betcha. You betcha. So I had to finally limit myself to four flannels. And they're very, very fun. And I took the first two of them. One is with hearts. The other is with mother foxes and a baby fox. And I told myself on this long weekend that I was going to cut at least two skirts out. And I did, and you know how this goes. I have not cut out this pattern in 30 years, literally. So it's really cool. I, you know, pulled out the pattern piece and pieces and ironed them with a cool iron, you know, and laid them out. And there were the pinholes from 1993. I mean, that was pretty cool. So I laid it out. Now, this particular pattern for the full circle skirt it's kind of interesting. It's meant to go up to a women's medium. Well, I'm not really a medium. However, the waistband is 40 inches. So I said, well, I guess if they want it to be a really compressed elastic waistband, sure, but I do not have a 40 inch waist, I'm relieved to say at this point. So, you know, it worked. So in other words, I just cut it out and you can see me wearing it. It's a rainbow pattern of hearts. I really love it. I love wearing rainbows anyway. I don't do it very often. I just haven't found a lot, but if you're going to make your own, you know. So anyway, there I was cutting this out and it took me like two hours to figure out the configuration of the fabric when you cut it out, because this one works at 90 degrees to the more typical selvage to selvage fold you do. This one you don't. This one you fold the selvage in half. So you fold it short end to short end and the long selvage is actually folded in half. But no, you don't even do that. You mark the middle, then you lay it out flat, then you fold each end in. So what you get in the end is the center part is two quarters of the fabric, and then at each end you folded one quarter over to touch the center line, and then you cut out your quarter circles, which become half circles, and you sew those babies together. Yeah, you can go online and find this pattern from various people. Just look up how to make a full circle skirt. 
but what was valuable here was, you know, it's easy to cut it with a pattern piece pinned onto it. It makes it a little faster instead of drawing it on. So that was very easy and very nice. And, you know, the other thing is they show you a good way to fold the fabric. Now, I said incorrectly a few episodes back, oh, I'm not making these skirts because you need a 60-inch wide fabric. No, you don't. But this explains why Simplicity never made this pattern in a size larger than a medium, because you start getting in trouble with, can I fit the quarter circle pattern onto the fabric in such a way that I can get a half circle out of each cut? It gets complex. Fortunately, with that waistband, I got plenty of room. So yeah, I'm still using my standard cut of elastic, which is I think 33 inches, and you know, when I sew it together, I lose an inch or two. So my standard cut of elastic is like 32 inches. My waist is bigger than that, but that compresses to a really good level so that my skirt doesn't fall off. So you can see me there happily modeling the full circle skirt, Simplicity 8863 from 1996 with hearts. I am going to tell you, if you like this, you can get it on Amazon, that there are sellers who have it posted on Amazon. Amazon themselves don't have it, but they will help you get it. I did get a spare for that reason. I just said I love this so much. If I ever damage it, I want a spare, and it's no longer available in the typical Simplicity catalog. So this was a really happy thing. The fox skirt, which I've been calling the Foxen, F-O-X-E-N, for reasons I can't explain. It just feels Anglo-Saxon. The Foxen, as you will see, is in progress. Yeah, there's a picture of me wearing it. It's actually finished, but it needs to be hemmed. And this afternoon, I did manage to pin up the hem. That is, I roll it for a quarter inch and iron it. And then I roll it in on itself again for another quarter inch and pin it. And then I seam it. So the Foxen is actually sitting behind me here on the love seat, waiting to have its final seam put in. So hopefully that will show up in episode 133. But you can see a close up of the fabrics I'm using as well in the show notes. And these were just incredibly happy projects. I also finished early in the week, right after I last recorded, Simplicity 9802 from 1996. This is what I am fondly calling a five seam skirt. And I actually give you instructions on how you can make one of these without a pattern, because I don't think Simplicity even publishes these anymore. And yet essentially the skirt I'm wearing, the full circle skirt, and this pattern, the 9802, these are both essentially five seam skirts. So what you're doing, you make a seam front and back, whether it's a rectangle, as in 9802, or whether it is a half circle in 8863. But you're making two of the same piece that fit you. And then seams number one and two are the two side seams. You put them inside out front to back and sew them. Now, there is a trick here that's not in my notes, whereas I, I do have the instructions to make a five seam skirt, because I just think this is something you all, you know, if you want to do this, you should be able to do this without a pattern. The same goes for a full circle skirt, but you can find those online. When you do seam number one, near the top, you're going to leave a gap so that when you fold over the waistband, on the inside, you're going to have this gap and you will put your elastic through it and then you can hand sew it shut. You have to experiment to find that gap, but there's another way to do this. Okay, so let's start with, you just put the two pieces for a five seam skirt. You take your two skirt pieces, you put them front to front, pin them, and then just do those edge seams. And that's two seams. Okay, and then you're going to fold the very top quarter inch over and just iron it down. If you want to, you can pin it. Okay, but you're doing that because you want to have a rolled edge at the bottom of your elastic on the inside of your skirt facing down. You don't want that rough edge there because you're trying to hold in your elastic. So yeah, you don't necessarily have to fold the top quarter inch over and iron it, but I do because I like that edge there. All right. Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to fold the top one and three quarters inch. I think the original pattern says one and five eighths, but I like to do one and six eighths because I'm nutty. Fold the top one and three quarter inch down and iron that and then pin everything down. So remember, 
you already folded a quarter inch under. Now you're folding over another one and three quarters inch on top of that. So what you've got is the very bottom edge is a, is a folded over quarter inch. So you're going to pin that down. This is going to be seam number three that you're going to sew as close as you can once you fold over that top one and three quarter inches. You're going to sew as close as you can to the bottom edge of that on the inside. So you're sewing through that quarter inch that you also folded under. So now you got seam number three. You also have a casing for your waistband elastic. And you can do this a number of ways. You can use any size elastic you want to use. These instructions are for half inch elastic, but you could just as easily use a one inch band. I don't like using one inch on my skirts. I'll use that on pajama bottoms, but I don't really like the way it feels on a skirt. It's up to you. Okay, so now seam number four. On this waistband, if you're using half inch elastic on this waistband, you're going to sew a seam three quarters of an inch down from the very top. What are you doing? You're making a casing. So now you're going to have two channels for your elastic to run through. You don't have to do seam number four if you're using a one inch elastic. It's up to you. Okay, but now I've folded down, I'm sorry, I folded it down, then I've sewed a seam three quarters of an inch down from the top, seam number four. Okay, now you're going to work your elastic through. But you say, how? I sewed everything shut. Yeah, that's why I was talking about those two, that hole you leave on one of the seams. But there's also a really easy way to do this. Don't leave the hole. Just sew as I've told you. Open a hole with a seam ripper on the inside of one of your inside seams. And you know, inside the casing, just use a seam ripper. Very gently, you're going to take out like three, four stitches. It doesn't take much. And then work your elastic through. You can find out how to do that online. I'm not going to explain that process. This is the most time consuming part is working the elastic through. And when you're finished, you're going to fit the skirt to you. And then you sew the ends of the elastic together. You know, you pin them together, try it on, make sure it's good, and then sew the elastic. The typical formula for your elastic is your waist measurement plus one inch. Uh, that usually comes out a little big on me. That's okay. You're going to fit this, and then when you've fitted it, you're just going to sew these little tiny seams on your elastic. You can do it by hand. I use my machine. It takes a second or two. I actually put two little seams in the elastic about half an inch apart from each other. And then you're just going to let that all go back into the waistband, and you can just darn a few stitches to close that gap you left, you know, that you ripped in the waistband to get the elastic in. Make sure you're ripping that on the inside of your waistband. Okay, so this is pretty easy to do. And if you get a simplicity pattern, they actually show you the way I described earlier about just leaving a little gap when you're sewing the waistband casing, but however you want, it's not hard. Okay, at this point, you've now got an elastic waisted skirt and you need to hem it. That's gonna be seam number five. I like to fold the raw edge under for a half inch and iron it down. Sometimes if I'm nervous, like on a full circle, I may pin it because a full circle skirt's hem is huge, it goes on for miles, and I'm afraid the ironing will kind of wear off. But anyway, you can fold the raw edge under for a half inch, iron that down. Then again, you're going to roll that under for another half inch, and there you're going to pin it, and then you're seaming your fifth seam, your hem, through both thicknesses. Why do I like these things? Number one, even if I sound complicated, it's really easy. You can see the instructions in the show notes if you want to try this. Number two, you can layer these babies. You can add pretty edgings to them. You can reduce their length very easily. You can just straight up cut them, or you can make a fold partway down to make a decorative tuck. And I've been known to top stitch lace onto the tuck to make it pretty. Like you can really decorate with these guys and you can play around with edgings and ribbons and all sorts of things. You can also layer them really well. If you make these in calico, two of these is a great skirt in the summer if you think they're too see-through. If you get a darker calico so it's not see-through, you can wear one. These are really pretty great. I also use them as under layers to my full circle skirts when I'm cold in the winter. You will be stunned how much that increases the warmth even of a flannel full circle skirt. So the five seam skirt, as I'm describing it, and I give you the measurements because you're basically just sewing two rectangles of fabric together. And I believe I gave you the measurements. Yeah, um, 
I cut on the fold so you get 21 by 39, but really on the fold it'll be 42 by 39 inches. That's the measurement Simplicity gave me on a size medium. I'm a little larger than that and it works. So do as you please there. But that is the basic five seam skirt. If you get, I always go for three yards. You don't need that. You need about 2.5 yards. Yeah, I have that in there. So, you know, if you're in a Joann's and you see a calico or a cotton you really like, just get two and a half yards and try this. It's not a hard thing to do. Like I said, the time consuming part is getting the elastic into the waistband and even that you get used to. When I use the measurements I give you, this comes out just above my ankles. And when I hem it, you know, maybe about a half inch higher, or it's about an inch higher than that. So I really like this because it's so adaptable. I can cut it short, I can keep it long, I can use it as a petticoat, whatever. Hey Gemma, it's called Cognitive. Why are we talking about sewing? Ah, eh, you know. Meanwhile, the Mother's Day Franken socks, you can see them. I'm on the second sock. I'm well on my way down it now. I'm on the foot and frankly, I'm probably about a half inch from the toe decreases. I always do top-down socks for those of you who don't know. So you can see a picture of the finished sock next to the mostly completed second sock which is flipped so that you can see the waist yarn that I put into rows of waist yarn because I do an afterthought heel because that fits my feet really well. I love this pair. These guys were started on Mother's Day that's why they're called that and I love these. I just love the way the colors came together on this. I think they're just gorgeous. Oh no, I started another one, yes, on Memorial Day. I don't know why, I just lost control. You wonder why I want to do a mini skein exchange at CFR to stop myself from this madness. If you're doing the mini skein exchange, remember this is a good place to use up extra yarn from your socks, assuming you have 100 yards or 25 grams left. I usually certainly do. So again, if you've got leftover sock yarns, you can bring them in for the mini skein exchange as long as you're working in 25 gram increments. And there you can see beneath it the fox and skirt. This is my next full circle sitting behind me waiting to be hemmed, but ready to go, just pinned and everything. The blueberry who socks, I don't know why I'm not done these. I'm on sock number two. And I am past the heel, but for some reason that bogged down. I try to do two repeats. You know, and it only takes 14 on each side of the heel. I don't know why it's taking so long. But anyway, I'm finishing the Blueberry Who's. I haven't touched the Dizzy Woodlands Country Cotton Shawl. That's an easy crochet. I'll get back to it. Or the Lane Splitter or the Don't Know Yet. Or the Pennsylvania Dutch Embroidery, which I was listening to my podcast from two years ago and I was talking about the Pennsylvania Dutch Embroidery. That's just painful. Hopefully in the summer. And also the Lady Eleanor. And the question is, why have I not touched these? But I'll talk about that when I get to the blather about why I'm not doing my bigger projects. You can see my favorite resources. I've now broken it down into sections. Those of you who are saying, but where are all the vendors for the CFR? They're being added one at a time. So this week I added oink pigments because I took the time out and did it. So I will add all the vendors. We've got Lisa, Sousa, Dizzy Blonde, and oink pigments. So I need to add laser sheep and I need to add Alpen Glow, assuming she's got a, web, a sales website. She sells equipment. She's an engineer. That's a whole other story. She's brilliant. But anyway, if you're wondering where they all are, and then I divided it into the, those dyers. Then I have the LYS and supplies resources. And then I have the extras, Birch and Cider for custom leather tags and Raspberry Studios on Etsy if you want to make chatelaines or get chatelaine supplies. Dizzy Blondes, that is my own spinning. Nope, but I am slowly working myself through a giant pile of Minerva fur on my desk. I really have been bad with that. So I'll get there. Meanwhile, let's get on to a strategy. So we're on mindfulness, and of course, I keep thinking about, I can't believe I'm doing this again with CFR, but I do think it's a very good thing to do. And so the mindfulness strategy this week is about that. It's about... You know, I was thinking about how much stuff I've done in my fiber life that really took me by surprise. The podcast was the first one. This is not something I ever thought anybody would listen to. And I, I am impressed that you do, that some of you at least do. You know, I, I know I'm putting some of you to sleep intentionally. You're using me to go to sleep at night. I'm cool with that. I use other podcasters that way. But it still blows my mind that I ever did a podcast, let alone that I did it starting 15 years ago now, that's just 
boggling to me. And then, of course, that led to CFR. It led to going to stitches. It led to reaching out to other podcasters. It led to learning to crochet, to spin, to fix spinning wheels. I mean, it's really been mind-boggling. And when I look back at it, what I keep thinking is, was it was all about managing the fear. I have always felt very incompetent around craft work. And I really don't know why. I had no reason that I could think of. I taught myself to embroider. Well, when I was a kid, they had these little kits where you embroidered on pillowcases. I don't know if I ever finished one. I was like seven or eight years old. My mother thought it would be good for a summertime event, except she never could do any craft work, which was weird. And eventually my best friend taught me to paint by number. And I really got good at that because my friend tutored me and her father was very skilled. And he taught her to do a lot of crafts by hand, including woodworking and painting. So I owe the beloved Chris so much on this. But over time, when I was in high school, I took a sewing class and again, felt incompetent. So I taught myself to embroider and that kicked it all off. I began to see that I could teach myself crafts. But the really shocking thing to me is how much fear has been connected with my craft work. I remember when I thought I could never spin and bless craft, I just can't blanking on Anne's, her name, but she really mentored me through learning to spin with a drop spindle. Stashy Mama, and she was very wise about it. She really saw who I am, that I get frustrated easily. And she just said, do it at your own speed. And she showed me the basics and she said, I'm going to stop. Just do it on your own. You'll be okay. And I got to park and draft. And then I went to, I believe it was Stitches. And I ran into, yeah, it was Stitches. And it was a Northern California spinning guild. And they got me to be able to spin with a drop spindle without fear, to be able to just drop it as opposed to park and drop, park and drop, you know, park and draft, rather park and draft. And so I'm very grateful. And when I couldn't spin well, I began to teach myself to fix spinning wheels because it became a way of kind of putting out to the universe that I wanted to do this stuff. And eventually, you know, I'm a pretty good spinner. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't think I'm someone like Jasmine who's been spinning since she was, you know, knee high to a grasshopper, but I do okay. I've made sweaters from my spinning. I've made socks from my spinning. So apparently I'm okay. I'm not highly experimental, but I never am in anything. I like my classics. But, you know, the upshot of all this is I keep thinking about when I stopped giving myself messages of fear, I began to ask myself, if I wasn't so afraid, what would I be doing? And the answer has been this huge revelation. And then I think, well, that's been the story of my life. People all my life have been telling me why I can't succeed at certain things. And I get really angry and frustrated and very oppositional when that happens. And that's really served me well, but I've also had to tame it as a result that I was so tired of being discouraged by people that I just spent a lot of my life being too angry and frustrated. And the moral of this story is don't be afraid. I'm thinking of, there's a hymn we used to sing in high school, be not afraid. And that's what I have as the strategy, but it's really true that you have to keep saying to yourself, why not me? Why shouldn't I do this? Why am I so afraid? And if I wasn't afraid, what would I be doing right now? And the answer is mind boggling. I mean, mind boggling that in my own life, it has been, I would be living in Europe. I would be traveling through Western Europe by myself or with new friends I make along the way. I would be getting a PhD and then a second one I would be learning all these languages. I would be driving to places I want to see by myself if I have to. I would be, name it, sewing skirts, knitting sweaters, whatever. So many of the restrictions in our lives are self-imposed. And yeah, you have to be careful because at moments like that, I really can sound like an entitled white chick. But... You know, then you think, I remember Will Smith's movie that he did with his own son, where he was playing a man who was homeless with his son, and he managed to get himself through business school and become wealthy and successful. You know, I'm not going to deny that some people have far greater challenges than I have ever faced. That's absolutely true. But what I am going to say is look at the flip side of that. If you have challenges and you 
don't confront them, you never have a chance of succeeding. My friend Liz Statmore used to always say, if you want to win the lottery, you have to buy a ticket. So you have to keep throwing yourself at these things that scare you. And to do that, you have to have a certain kind of mindfulness. You have to have an internal self-talk. This also goes into distress tolerance. This is the encourage strategy from the IMPROVE acronym. But you have to have this self-talk of, why not me? Why shouldn't I win? Why shouldn't I succeed? Now, there are good answers. There are changes you have to make. Before I won my first scholarship, was that my first? It was actually my second. I won the one to my high school just by taking a written test. I could do that. But when I was in high school and I wanted to win a National Science Foundation scholarship, I had to talk to myself for weeks in a mirror. I had to rehearse with myself telling some imaginary committee why I was the person who deserved to win a National Science Foundation grant at 17, and it worked. That you have to keep saying, why should I not win this? Why should I not succeed? And then you have to be honest about the answers and you have to address them. But I, I can say this much that, yeah, I probably do sound entitled and privileged and I'm sorry. I don't know how else to say this, but I do know the one thing, the one truth in my life is you have to keep going after the things that scare you if you want to get any kind of success. And I have to say, in tribute, since it's Memorial Day, I learned this from my father, the amazing Vincent Massey. And I'm just going to say this. He was a Pearl Harbor survivor. And he was told when he woke up after Pearl Harbor with a head injury that they were going to do brain surgery on him if he agreed and that he was going to die in the surgery. But then if he didn't die in the surgery, he'd die the day after. Well, this went on. He kept being told he was going to die until 1974. When somebody finally said, oh, no, you're not going to die of that. <sighs> but the interesting thing is I grew up in the shadow of this man. And he was a really good father. He's a really nice man. But the one thing that could make him hard to manage was if you said no to him. Because his whole life had been a giant no. Starting with being born Italian in an Italian ghetto with darker skin. And he was always told he wasn't white enough and everything else. Actually, he grew up being called the N-word, to be honest. And then he goes in the Navy, and now it's not enough that he's the wrong skin color, so to speak. But he also is being told he's going to die at any minute. He built himself into a self-made millionaire. He built his own business. He raised a family of six children. And he was a hugely successful man. And the strangest thing was, he was really kind. I could tell him anything. But the thing I figured out when I was young was that I could go to him and say I was afraid of something, and he would try really hard to be sympathetic, but you could always see this confusion in his face, and I realized eventually I'm telling a guy who's under a death sentence about my fear of these things that must seem so tiny. So he was very supportive, but I kind of realized I sound like an idiot to this man. <laughs> so despite his being supportive, the lesson I got was don't be afraid, and he would always be the first one to say go after the biggest prize. So when I said I want to go to a really school, good school, he said, why are you not going to the Ivy League? He didn't want me to go to Harvard because he wanted me near home. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania. But, you know, here on Memorial Day, I want to tell you the great lesson I learned from the most important veteran in my life was don't be afraid. Keep throwing yourself at your goals. And God knows he lived it. So... You know, you have to ask yourself, this is mindfulness at its best. Why are you holding yourself back? Why are you setting limits? Or why are you accepting the limits that other people put on you? Sure, he failed a lot. I can't remember any time, but I know he must have. I know I've failed a lot. The thing is, I don't remember those failures too much because I'm working so hard at going after what I want, that I have won a lot of things earned a lot of things, progressed in ways I never would have thought possible. What would you be doing if you weren't afraid? Okay, in the fluffy books, still watching Seinfeld. Seinfeld, very interesting. It's from the early 90s. And it's very intriguing because there was an episode where they show the, the female lead basically being mm, threatened with sexual assault by a crazy person. And they keep running a laugh track through it? Yeah. 
it was kind of scary just to watch. I finally fast forwarded through it. She does spray him with binaca and they make a joke out of that too. And I'm thinking there's nothing funny about this. Meanwhile, I finished The Late Mrs. Willoughby, which is the second book in a two book so far series by Claudia Gray. And this series is the Mr. Darcy and Miss Tilney series. They are not the Mr. Darcy you're thinking of if you're a Jane Austen fan like I am. It is the son of Lizzie and Darcy. And Miss Tilney is the son of the Tilneys. Oh, what's the name of the book? Northanger Abbey. And the Miss Tilney is the daughter of the protagonist of Northanger Abbey who marry. I don't want to give spoilers. I'm not going to say names there, but you should figure it out if you ever read Northanger Abbey. And Claudia Gray has a great sense of humor about how all the original Austen characters turned out. I particularly like what she has done with Mrs. Tilney Sr. And I'm not going to do any spoilers there. The interesting thing is this series, these two books, Claudia Gray is superimposing 21st century psychotherapy on these characters. So one character is clearly high functioning autistic some of the characters are clinically depressed. One character is just spelled out as a narcissist. And if you have read Jane Austen, and you should if you're going to read this series, you want to read all of them, they're all popping up. It's, it's just a lot of fun because she's doing this. How realistic is it? Hard to know. Hard to know. And I don't think you have to know that this is just a bunch of Jane Austen spinoffs and they're a lot of fun. I really, really started out hating all the Jane Austen spinoffs. And now I realize there's this enormous genre of ooh, continue Jane Austen or rewrite Jane Austen. Why you would think you can rewrite Jane Austen, I don't know, because her style is so perfect. I really do believe that Persuasion is probably the single best novel in every way in the English language. However, once you get past the idea that Lizzie Bennet could have had a dragon, you start having fun with these things. Something I really like. Well, first of all, I've been drinking my own iced tea with soda water I buy from TJ's, flavored soda water. I favor the orange and the lemon. And I'm also still working on the tea tastings, which I've got another good tea there that I'll come down to. The other thing I really like, as I've pretty much told you, are classic patterns from Simplicity. Now, if you don't know what you're looking for, good luck on that one. They are republishing some of them. And if you want to see some of them, curiously, go look in their costume section. Now, there are a lot of good new young pattern designers out there self-publishing. I haven't even explored that, but I was just trudging into Joann's and looking at the Simplicity catalog. Why am I not looking at McCall's or Butterick? They've got them. I don't know if they have Butterick anymore. Vogue is still there. I don't have to. <laughs> I have what I want. And, and that's really important. What I want to say to you about this is, look, I've learned something really important. If I want to listen to sophisticated sewing stuff, I can listen to Gigi Nitmore. The woman is taking classes on stuff that I would never dream of taking. And there is no question that she and Jasmine and I hope Danger Mouse soon are making these beautiful clothes out of them. Okay, now you know me. You've seen what I knit. I'm knitting the same five patterns over and over. Why? Because that's not how I groove. I certainly have made some more highbrow dresses and such. Back in the 90s, I made myself an evening gown for a charity event in red velvet. It was gorgeous. And it was perfectly fitted and all that. I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to have a reliable wardrobe of classic shapes and patterns. So I'm making the same vest over and over. I'm making the brick over and over. I'm making the full circles over and over. I'm making the five seam skirts over and over. You know, and the same socks, by the way. Yes, it's true. I'm using basic, boring, routine vanilla socks. That's okay, too. That's okay, too. What really shocks me is I now have a whole new wardrobe of beautiful skirts that I have made in the last month and they're fantastic and my closet is beautiful and I can pull any one of them out, dress them up, dress them down. 
They go with my sweaters. I now am motivated to knit sweaters in a few different colors. I definitely want to dig into my reds to make at least a vest to go with this insanely beautiful rainbow of hearts skirt that I'm wearing right now. That it is wonderful to take time to do innovative, interesting stuff, but it's also great just to make a simple wardrobe of classic, easy stuff that works. And that's what I'm doing. And, you know, I can put a belt around it and hide these easy elastic waists, or I can just pull the top over it. I have basics. I have a pile of leggings. I have a pile of turtlenecks, a pile of t-shirts. And that's all I need, and underwear. And basically then I'm just putting top layers on it based on my own stuff. I am so happy these days wearing the me made stuff. So I would encourage you not to chicken out from these easy patterns to experiment. You go to Joann's, you buy something on sale in terms of fabric and you experiment. And you know, if you blow it, buy a little extra, you know, it's okay. Okay, so put a lid on it. The tea tastings continue. And if there was a gap here, it's because I just took a really great video call from our own Peachy. Thank you so much. A lot of help there. Really appreciate a huge amount of information. It's nothing like talking to the president of one of the really great spinning guilds to get help. But anyway, so let's go back to put a lid on it. The tea tastings. I have the latest Plum Deluxe, and this is a winner. This is called Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise Herbal Tea. And it's rooibos based, but it's got everything in it. Peppermint, lemongrass, everything in it. I tell you, uh, blue corn flour that I love. And the flavor of this is just through the roof great. This makes the best iced tea. Seriously, just get a diffuser, stick it in a bottle or a mason jar in the sun. But this stuff is sensational. You can't do go wrong with it. It makes a great hot tea. It makes a great iced tea. Why? It's got a lot of the flavors of summer for me, including the lemongrass and the the mint, but also because it's a rooibos, it holds up well when you heat it and it takes a little bit of sugar, but don't overdo that because there's so much good, strong herbal flavor in this one that if you drown it out with sweet, you're going to hate yourself. A little bit of swerve in my case does kind of kick up the mint flavor for me, but I, I just have to tell you, I think this one is one of the great Plum Deluxe blends. So this is healthy, wealthy, and wise herbal tea. And it comes highly recommended. It's going to get on the household tea list here in Cognitive Fiberland because I just love it. Let's get on to the blather. Finally, finally, I say, I finished my ASL class. So in episode 133, I took it off the list when I was prepping that template. But we had our last projects this past Wednesday night, the 24th, I think it was. Is that right? Can I still do math? Yeah. And there were three of us in our group. One of us just flaked. The teacher knew it. She knew it when she assigned the groups and she made it clear she knew it. The remaining person and I, I did the research and Eliza did the slides, which I think I said last week. And she did a really good job. And the problem was we were supposed to each present the part we had researched and we just faked it. And it went really well. Um, Eliza just read the slides and I took the part that I was very strong in out of my research, which of course is doing a school placement for the kid because I've done so many meetings for that as a clinician and also talking about the challenges. And it just went very well. The teacher got a little irksome because she started looking for gaps in what we'd done and there weren't any to be brutally honest. And there weren't any because I'm a professional researcher for heaven's sake. And even the teacher doesn't have my advanced degrees. And, you know, there's a moment where you say, lady, this is not a venue to compete with somebody who's a, yeah, got advanced degrees. But apart from that, I have to say we finished, we were covered with glory. And uh, the teacher seemed satisfied. I'm pretty sure we got A's except for our person who flaked, and I don't care what she got. I don't care how that works out. It was nice when I walked out, I was walking through the parking lot, and one of my classmates who I quite like said, I don't want to lose touch with you. Please come to the deaf events. And I'm hoping I will. It means I have to throw myself back into studying vocabulary from 
my 101 class and then move on to the 102 self-guided as best I can. I do have the books. There are no more classes at times I can take. The universe clearly wanted me to learn some ASL and to get in tune with deaf culture. I have to tell you, the deaf culture class was good because it was a really relatively non-threatening way to talk about culture. And the thing is that the population of the deaf compared to other cultural subgroups in America, I don't know if I want to call them subgroups, but you know what I'm trying to say, I assume. It's a very small culture, but it's a very real culture. And in the room, you have one person in that culture. Well, also one of my classmates, but not, she was hard of hearing. She can hear, but she identifies now as more deaf than she did at a younger age. So what happened was the teacher made a very safe place and we got to talk about culture and we didn't have too much anger or defensiveness. Even when we did, studying the idea of what culture is gave us a way to talk about that, that if somebody is angry or defensive or hostile, instead of saying negative things about them, you realize they're at a different place in the process of acculturation. And that in itself was incredibly helpful to realize that people come from all different subcultures and we're all trying to get along and there are old grudges and old biases and we can outgrow them. And this was a very non-threatening environment to work on that. And it really did work that the cultures in the class were a bit hostile to each other in the beginning. And there was such a really nice bonding by the end. And it made the class very happy. It made the teacher very happy. And I thought, you know, it's all very well and good to criticize her a bit when I talk about how the final project was handled. But really, I have to hand it to her. She really accomplished something. And I owe her a lot because I got to study culture in a less threatening way without feeling like I have to defend, name one, my whiteness, my Italianness, my brownness, my Amishness my Welshness, my Philadelphianess. It, it really was about as non-threatening a way to get us all exposed to the issues of cultural understanding. And I'm very, very grateful for that. I feel like I grew up a lot in this class and it was helpful. Does this make me perfect in every respect? Don't be idiotic, but at least I feel like I'm not too old to learn. I feel like this was really eye-opening and intelligent. And all through it, you kept saying, but if people in the deaf culture are going through this, what are people in the other cultures going through outside of the white mainstream? And that's the value to open your mind to that kind of thinking. So that's it. I don't think I'm going to get to do much more sign language formally, but I'm deeply grateful for spending two semesters immersed in this. It's been an incredibly valuable experience. On the pop date, we are in search of a groomer. Everybody's had all their shots and everything. Captain's nose is healing nicely on steroids every other day. And there's a picture there of my knitting nook. You may remember that I got the beautiful green rocker and I did finally get it in the bedroom under my ot light with the magnifying mirror. So you can see my chair and it's got the temperature blanket thrown over it see some yarn bins, some exercise equipment in the back. There's the wooden blanket chest that my best friend gave me that she handmade for our wedding. And you can see some dog damage on the blinds. Hey, we're not perfect. And then while I was sitting in that chair, I was looking forward and you can see in the next picture what I was seeing. And Minerva and Captain were sacked out together on my floor near the heated towel rack and at the foot of the bed. And it just was so happy because I thought they really do like each other. I just don't think it's that obvious because I talk about them in a very isolated way. Like I talk about the cat and I talk about the dog separately, but yes, Minerva actually likes her puppies. The hubs date, he's doing pretty well. And he was a brick today. 
uh, in a few ways, and I'm very grateful. I, I love my husband. He's a great guy. And one of the things I love was every time I pop into his study and I go, look, and he looks at me carefully because he knows I've made something and he's got to figure it out. And somehow he survives these pop quizzes. But he is especially wonderful about my sewing projects that it always has blown his mind a little bit that I can make clothing and then just wear it. And I think the knitting, he's like, okay, but the skirts, he's a clear fan that he just thinks they're interesting, they're unusual, they fit, they cost next to nothing. So it's really very rewarding to put on some clothes and walk into his office, something I've made, and have him give me all the love and reward. And he really was a brick today, I have to say. I did a long afternoon of slogging around the hotels and I was so done with it. And we met for dinner at Topper's, you know, a pizza place with my son. My son loves the place. And I just remember driving in the parking lot and there was this little blue Prius and it just filled me with joy. It's such a, it's such a him thing, that little bright blue Prius. It just made me feel beautiful. So the hub state, he's doing well. And we know we're getting through. Um, fire season is upon us and he's weeding everything. We got him a weed whacker and he loves the thing, but he's been astonishing with it. He's just done about a half acre and let me tell you this stuff was thick and he's just weed whacking away and so I'm so grateful to him. On the calendar the Cognitive Fiber Retreat 2023 Saturday November 11th and again one more thanks to our Peachy because that um, the more I sit here the more I'm realizing how valuable that conversation was. We were covering a lot of ground and it was much more dense than I realized but thank you so much Jen and Again, if you want to see the vendors list, oh, by the way, it looks like we have so many members of the Greater LA Spinning Guild that they are there in force. I don't think they're going to have any kind of formal presence, but so many of them are there. They're like half of us. So yeah, and, and everything will be good. And anything that you want to reach out to them about when you're at the Cognitive Fiber Retreat, you should. The Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, my absolute personal favorite, will be in Anaheim on December 12th through 17th. I'm expecting to spend part of that in Anaheim because I have to. I have to get the units. But also they have a Zoom component. So I'm just living for that. I've really got to take that time off. And I'm looking forward to it. Minerva gets the last word. And it's, I'm coming your way that Minerva is this unavoidable presence in the house. So there's one wonderful picture there. I've never gotten this kind of angle where she's striding towards me with this determined expression coming up the hall. And then there's another one. I was trying to sew my skirts today and she just kept getting in my lap. So finally, I just took a really awkward one-handed picture of this big blob of her in my lap in front of my sewing machine. And you can see me trying to run my skirt one-handed. So the point is, Minerva wants you to know that she is an unavoidable, inexhaustible presence. And that's kind of what I think cognitive and the CFR are as well, that we are coming your way. And while we haven't got full information on the venue, we have a lot of other options and we're working on it. And I do believe we're going to make this happen. As Jen and I were observing, it's going to be significantly different than the the fiber retreats that we had from 2009 through, I think it was 2016. And yeah, and that's great that we're going to make our own thing here. And just, you know, CFR 2023 is going to be its own beast, but by heavens, we're coming your way. In the meantime, everybody, you know, the drill, I'm so tired of the COVID drill, I don't think I'm even going to say it, particularly since it's now 11, 10 p.m. on May 30th, 2023. But really what I'm going to say is please, everybody, stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, 
www.blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.